can turn to John chapter number one. And uh, thank you, Alan, for helping me out with that. Thank you for those that gave a testimony. Brother, we'll probably have a few minutes and stuff if you want to give us a challenge. But yeah, if you uh, uh, keep those, we're, we're, we're trying to keep everything a little shorter. We've got our plate filled, but we don't want to quench the Holy Spirit either. Amen. We came out to hear from God. At the end of the book of John, John tells us the purpose for why he wrote his gospel. And uh, he says there in John 20, verse, verses uh, 30 and 31, he says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. So Jesus did a lot of miracles, a lot of things that we're, we're not told about uh, in the gospel of John and really in the gospels uh, as a whole. I think there's another place where the Bible says that if, if all of it uh, had been recorded, the world could not contain the books that had been written. Uh, but here he just says, hey, there are many signs that Jesus did in the presence of his disciples, which are not written. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Now, uh, John has written a record of Jesus's life. Of course, he had no beginning, and John starts out with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he goes all the way through the gospel, and, and here at the end of the gospel, he's, he records the death, the burial, of uh, the death and, and burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, all right? And so uh, the point I'm trying to make is uh, about that is, is that if this you know, if this were the cross and this were before the cross, John is writing his gospel after the cross. All of these things have already happened and he's writing it. So when he's writing this epistle, the whole, the whole gospel, when he's writing it, he's writing it in what we would call the New Testament church age. He's writing it after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and he writes it specifically so that you, look at what it says, these are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Now, believing, what tense is that? Is that past tense? That's present tense. Everybody understand there? That present tense. So John is standing on this side of the cross and he's saying, if you believe in Jesus, you will have life through his name. Everybody understand that this is what he's saying. But what did Jesus do? What, what do we need to believe about Jesus? Well, that he lived a perfect life, that he was God, right? That he was God from the beginning, that he took on flesh. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, that he was the lamb of God that took away the sin of the world, that he was the light of the world. He was the bread of life. He went to the cross. He died on a cross. He rose again from the dead. You believe in Jesus Christ. You will have eternal life. Amen. Believe, believe now, believing right now. Okay. Now go to back to the beginning, if you would. And, uh, and I'll show you just a few things. The Bible says here in verse number 11 of John chapter number one, it says, he came unto his own and his own. Now look at the next, what's that next word? What tense verb is that? Past tense. So John is writing after the cross and he's saying that when Jesus came, he first came to his own. Who is his own talking about there? He's talking about Israel. He's talking about the Jews. He came to Israel. He came unto their own and they did not believe him. Past tense, meaning the Jews... Uh, uh, Israel as a nation before the cross did not receive Jesus Christ. They received him not. Everybody understand? Then verse 12. But as many as, now what's that next word? Received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now you notice the verb tense of that. That's past tense. So he's saying this. He's saying those who came, Jesus came to the Jews and his own received him not. The, the, the nation of Israel in particular, the leadership and so forth, they rejected them. But, but there was a group of people before the cross. There was a group of people who did receive him, who did receive them. And to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And this reception of Jesus is equated as 
believing on Jesus. He said, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now follow me as I walk you through this. So receive and believe are equated. Anybody follow me? And God says those that receive Jesus, God accounted it as faith, belief in him, and God gave them the power to be called the sons of God. Now the next verse tells us this. Which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In other words, born of God. So now we have a third term that comes in here. We have receiving Jesus equated with believing Jesus, which is equated with being born of God. And all of those things are equated in having life. God giving them life and the power to become the sons of God. Now we turn over a few chapters to John chapter number 3. And we see that John continues. Now all of this, by the way, up until this point is before the cross. In John 1, these people live before the cross, all right? But John is going, and Jesus really, through the apostle John as he writes this, is going to tell us that this being born of God is something that is going to happen not just before the cross, but after the cross as well. John chapter number one, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night, said unto him, Rabbi, we know thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse number five, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Now I've got to go quickly through this, but Nicodemus is there. He comes to Jesus. He's got some questions. How am I born again? Or, I, I, you know, how, how, how do I have eternal life? Who are you, Jesus? Really, that's what it is. I mean, he says, I know you're a teacher. I know you're a good man, but I think there's something more. And Jesus goes right to the heart of it. He says, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. Nicodemus was a Jew. He was a man who, could, who would have naturally trusted the fact that he was his, his, his physical birth made him one of God's chosen people. And yet Jesus was telling him, no, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Okay, uh, your, your right of circumcision, that doesn't save you. Uh, uh, that might bring you into a covenant promise with God regarding the promises that were made to Israel, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean you're born again. So Nicodemus is confused, and that's what you have in John chapter 3. You have Jesus explaining to Nicodemus what it means to be born again. And Nicodemus should have known these things. Jesus is talking to him, and he says, man, you know, I, you're a master of Israel, verse number 10, and you know us not these things. Of course, Jesus goes then to the Old Testament and he pulls out an example to teach Nicodemus what it means to be born again. Verse number 14, he says, And Moses, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whosoever, now notice this, what's the next word? Past tense or present tense? Present. Present tense. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For, for, this is the reason why. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, now notice present tense, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everybody see that? So John is writing this after the cross, and yet he's saying, hey, look, just like those who received, believed, and were born of God before the cross were, were, had power to become the sons of God, so also this is, this is true after the cross. If you believe, you will, have, you will not perish, but you will have everlasting life. Look at the next verse. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be Saved. Now we add another. We, we, we've got received, believed, 
born of God, born again. Now we've got saved, and they're all talking about the same thing. They're all talking about the same experience of a person coming to Jesus Christ as Savior and receiving Him or believing on Him to save them from their sins. Everybody see that? Now, in, in throughout the Gospels, or uh, you'll see terms like being born again. Uh, when you get to books like Romans, the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. The, the term saved is a Bible term. It's found throughout uh, uh, Paul's epistles, all right? But we see it equated here in the same one. Now, I love what it says, whosoever, whosoever, all right? That means whoever. <laughs> that means anyone who believeth on him will not perish, but have everlasting life. He follows that up by saying, that God did not come into the world. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. Now he's using the world. He's using the word world. So he started with the individual. Now he's saying, hey, look, the whole world has a potential to be saved. The whole world has the opportunity to be saved in Jesus if they believe in him. All right. But that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not, again, present tense, is condemned already, past. You're already condemned. That's your natural condition. You have to have a, a time when you call out to Christ as Savior if you want to pass from death to life because death is the, that's, that's the, that's the state you're in. If nothing changes, you'll die in your sin, friend. Everybody understand? So we come, to the, we come to this table, and we remember what Jesus Christ did for us, and we understand that it's because of his broken body and his shed blood that we have passed from death to life because if he hadn't, and if there had never been that moment when we came to him, we would still be dead in our trespasses and sins. And we've condemned already. And uh, so we rejoice in this. I, I bring this out because as, as, as we teach, and I, and I do believe that we need these moments of teaching and preaching because there's a great delusion that is sweeping the country from Satan, I believe. And it's coming in many different forms. One of the forms that you're starting to hear is this idea, this truth somehow that we're not to be born again. That somehow that was only a pre-cross type of term, okay? There are people out there that are teaching this and promoting this and saying, oh, no, that was, for, that was only for those that were in the transitional period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But, but when you look at the Scriptures carefully, you can see that John is writing after the cross, and he's saying, we need to presently believe and we'll be saved. We'll have eternal life. And I'm writing these things, these things, these terms I'm using. Uh, the reason why I'm writing to you is because they pertain to the New Testament church age so that you might be saved. And so I do it. I do it here at communion because as we fellowship with God, let's be strengthened by the fact that salvation is all of Jesus, amen? And it's all of him. We praise the Lord that we can be born of God and we must be born again if we'll enter in. But you say, how? Well, it's by receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's what it means to be born again. It means to say, God, I'm a sinner, but I believe you're the Savior and that you died for me on that cross and you rose again the third day. Save me. Save me, all right? You don't have, like Brother Knox said, you know, you don't have to say three Hail Marys and five Our Fathers. You don't have a magical prayer. There isn't a magical wand. There's not a special priest who can, who can like, confirm that what you said was the exact magical statement. You follow what I'm saying? All throughout scriptures, guys, people were just like, remember me, one guy said. He just said, Lord, remember me. Isn't that something? And, you know, Jesus didn't say, okay, I will. I'll remember you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He looked at him and he said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Isn't that good? Uh, he didn't say, wait a second, do you, do you, do you, you're not repenting enough. <laughs> do you believe enough? Again, I'm trying to be, 
you know, root or facetious about this. Faith and repentance are, are precious things. And they, but we start small in those areas. They're present when we get saved. But, but Jesus didn't say that. All right. He knew. He knew the guy didn't know half the stuff. He was dying on a cross. He just prayed out. We see people say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We see people, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. And, and, and God looks down and he says, that counts. <laughs> that counts. <laughs> when he sees that, he's like, oh, he trusted Jesus. Yeah. Why? Because it's all of Jesus. Jesus did everything. It's all, he took all every sin, he took all uh, of our sins on himself, and he gave us all of his righteousness in his place, and it's his faith that justifies us, not your faith. Your faith just places you in Christ, praise the Lord, and, 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 uh, but it's, it's his faith that justifies us, and uh, so let, let's rejoice that we have such a wonderful Savior, and the Passover, as we heard, amen, Christ, our Passover, who was perfect, the sinless, uh, perfect Lamb of God uh, that was offered, and that blood is what washes away everything, and when God looks, he looks at you, he looks at me, you know what he looks, he is, is the blood of Jesus, has the blood of Jesus been applied to your heart, that's it, he doesn't look to see if you were worthy, how pure was that faith when you cried out for help? Was it loud enough? Did you shed enough tears? Right? No. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that been applied to your heart. And when he sees the blood, he passed over. The wrath of God was poured out on him. So uh, let's go ahead and at this time, let's, uh, let's remember the Lord's table. And as I say often, if you're not trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, then don't partake of this. Because this is just a way to say thank you. And how can you say thank you for something that you're openly rejecting? The Bible warns us not to do that. Uh, to do so uh, would be to bring uh, damnation on yourself. So don't do that. But if you're here and you're saved, you're born again, you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, uh, then you're welcome to uh, partake of this and to say thank you. Because that's what this means. It means that we're praising Jesus for what he did. And uh, we're rejoicing that we have eternal life because the Bible says that for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. As the pianist begins to play a hymn, uh, we'll pass this out. Brother Lauren, if you'll help me out. Brother Mitchell, if you could help me out. 